Good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are today. My name is Lex Mishakis. I'm the Chief Experience Officer here at Habits at Work. And with me is Brie Miller. Brie, hello. Brie is our Chief Product Officer. And we're here today to have a conversation around authenticity as a practice in selling. Now, if you know Brie and I at all, you know we could probably talk about this for hours and hours. And I think the biggest challenge is going to be keeping it to 15, 20 minutes or so. So we will endeavor to do that today and get straight into it, Brie. What do you say? That sounds good to me. Yeah. Let's start by putting some shape around what authenticity actually means. It's a word we use often, we hear often, and I think everybody maybe relates to it in a slightly different way. So Brie, how do you think about authenticity as a practice? Yeah, for me, it's this real sense of resonance when your outer expression is really aligned with and a match for your inner sense of values and sense of self. And so I like to look at it this way, like in life, we make a lot of compromises. And a lot of times we make them about ourself and our way of being. There are external compromises that we make, like maybe letting our spouse decide where to go for dinner. And then there are a lot of internal compromises that are a lot harder because they have to do with maybe going against beliefs or ways of seeing ourselves or seeing the world. And I think a lot of times the way that we show up in work and in life kind of leads us toward making some of those internal compromises, which over time can have us just waking up and saying, who am I? How did I get here? And so to me, this authenticity is really about making sure that we make a lot fewer of those internal compromises. So inner and external versions of ourselves are the same. I find that distinction between external and internal so powerful. And my experience of this has been I'm constantly making those internal judgment calls because I'm trying to show up in a way that's not in integrity with myself and my beliefs and who I am. So I'm constantly doing this work of repackaging all of that to put it out there. And it's exhausting. Yeah. It's so tiring. I get to the end of the day and I'm like, what just happened? I know I've worked hard, but I feel drained. And what's really tough is we're in this culture where it's become normal to work ourselves to the bone. Maybe we take a one week vacation, we restore ourselves, we rejuvenate the bank account, so to speak, but then we wipe it all away again. And we're just in this constant cycle. And it's a cycle that I think we're starting to really focus on as a social reckoning, but it requires so much deliberate work. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues that makes it hard for people to practice authenticity is that people don't have a level of self-awareness around what the meaningful values or internal kind of guideposts are because we've been so conditioned to look to an external example of what success is of what good is of how you should be in the world and honestly, we're so busy for the most part that we don't have a lot of time to stop and spend and ruminate and really do that deep inner work to figure out what is most meaningful and important to us uniquely. What do our unique set of values and beliefs look like in the world? And a lot of times we just take for granted the way we already see the world, which is honestly based on a lot of how we formed as a child. It's not necessarily yeah. anything that serves us anymore. And so being able to go back in and really assess and build a series of values over time, because I have to say from personal experience, this is not something where you can just set aside 30 minutes on a Sunday and be like, what are my values? And they'll just <laughs> magically pop into <laughs> your mind. These are things that you build over time through the practice, like you said, because our self-awareness develops and deepens over time in practicing and trying to show up authentically and trying to unearth what these things are that are important and meaningful to us in our lives. It's not something we can just jot down in a worksheet one afternoon. It's something that takes a life to, a lifetime practice. Yeah. And that word practice, I think, is everything because there were some moments where, yeah, I can make a choice that feels in alignment with me and what I want to do. There are other times when that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And when I think about our community of sales professionals in particular, when you've got quota closing in on you, when you're having 
five meetings a day, when you're cold calling, when you're balancing the needs of your team and everyone around you, you default to almost like your lowest form of training. You default to those mechanisms you develop as a child that served you back then. They were to protect you. But now what it's doing is having you show up from a really inauthentic place. I know for me, Brie, and we've talked about this a lot, it was people pleasing. Mm -hmm. I was obsessed with subconsciously everybody liking me and they did. And it was hard because I did have success in the most traditional terms because of that. I did get promoted. I did form relationships with people, but because it was coming from a place that wasn't in integrity with myself, it wasn't sustainable. It was just exhausting. And so for all of the salespeople out there who are trying to balance all of these things at the same time, it's such a tough choice to make in the moment, but that is what it is. It's a practice. It's a choice at any given point in time. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, early in my career, what got me to where I felt like I was successful is being loud, direct, declarative, having all of the answers and, you know, forcefully leading. And I, you know, I, I wanted to get better and go to the next level of my career, but this thing that had gotten me to where I was actually started to actively hold me back. It created this kind of false ceiling for me. I was no longer being effective or I couldn't be effective in a new type of role or in a new leadership position because of some of these ways of me being authentic in the past, I had to evolve what authentic meant for me. And so it took a lot of reflection and practice and getting to understand myself to realize I actually need to talk less in a meeting. I need to listen more. I need to not just pretend like I'm taking in others' ideas. I need to like actually realize <laughs> I need to change my limiting belief around I'm the only one that has good ideas. I mean, come on. And, and so it takes a lot of that practice to start to see what else is possible. If what I actually want as an outcome in my work life is to be effective, is to have others, you know, want me to be a leader, not just have to have me as a leader, then I have to show up a different way in order to get that outcome that I want. And in fact, then practicing these different ways of being to listen more and to be open to other ideas and to fully collaborate and trust other people, it actually feels much more resonant to me because it is actually connected to deep internal values that I didn't even know that I had 10 years ago. So it's this unearthing process, I feel like. It's um, you know stopping running on default like you were doing with the people using or I was doing with the being very declarative and it's actually just putting a pause on the play and seeing like, what's happening here? How have I shaped myself? Why have I shaped myself this way? How did I get here? And not to judge, but just to say, like, what is serving me? How has this served me so far? Thank you. I love you for doing this for me, for getting me this far in my career. You have made me successful. However, now I'm going to put my effort and energy into a different way of being and showing up. It's just a uh, so practice. I'll keep saying that. <laughs> it's a journey. And Brie, what I love about having this conversation with you is we are on polar ends, right? You're talking about being declarative and having a hard time opening up and embracing other people's ideas. I'm on the totally different side of the spectrum where my inclination is to say, oh, Brie, tell me about your idea and to stifle my own. And within that, there are thousands of different ways it can manifest for all of us, which is to your point why it takes 10 years. There's also not a perfect way to figure out what authenticity means for you unless you take the time to reflect and do the work, but also you're in an environment that supports it. And I know for yeah. me that has been so crucial working with you, getting to know my community more, feeling embraced in that way. And I remember a moment somewhat recently actually, where I'd had such a busy day. I was delivering sessions all day. I was on client meetings. We had team meetings and I went to bed and I was like, huh, I feel that tired. And in fact, I'm actually really excited and buzzy. Yeah. And it dawned on me that I was so used to going to bed, feeling totally depleted and assuming that that feeling was what it meant to work hard. 
And I'm having to rewire that as well to reshape mm -hmm. the way I think about hard work and digging in because it feels so different. Of course, I get tired. Yeah. That happens, but it's a total shift in the way that you exist as a human. And it's such a good feeling. You're just reminding me now, Lex, of last year when I was, you know, amidst the pandemic, we were shifting our whole business and I was, you know, definitely got into burnout in the later part of the year. But in the middle of the year, I was just like humming along and I was finding all of these ways to express myself because you couldn't go out, you couldn't dress up, you could, you know, like we were wearing pajamas every day, let's face okay. it. We were on video chats. I mean, just uh, some days it was 14 hours a day. And I was just finding it so draining, as I'm sure many other people were. And one of the things that I did that was just fun, that gave me like a little bit of self-expression was I started to dress up for Friday team happy hours. But what's even more interesting than that is that I started to post about it on LinkedIn and I started to share it with our customers. When I would have customer meetings, I would tell them what I was doing and we would have a whole conversation about it. And they would ask me to show up like that the next time to their meeting. <laughs> or, I'm, I'm serious. People asked me to do a tarot card reading, you know, because I was joking about that, that I did that during one of our, our team happy hours. And it became a conversation piece. But it also, I feel like, allowed our customers to even be a little bit more themselves in the meeting because I was expressing myself in somewhat of a fun, you know, silly way, of course, but it was a way that they actually got to know me a little bit better. So what I love is that it can be a pattern disrupt too. So for so many of us, especially sellers that are out there trying to differentiate themselves, it's not that you go create a gimmick. This is very different from a gimmick. This is very much showing up as your full self, whatever version of that is in the current moment, embracing it and realizing that what is making you different is actually your superpower in that moment. How can you fully embody that in a customer meeting or, you know, with your team as you're creating a pitch, whatever it is, but it creates a pattern interrupt and people don't expect it sometimes. And so when you stand out from the same old standard approach of how everyone does everything, it creates conversations with customers. They get to know you better. It deepens connections. It invites other people into a connection with you. So there's so much on offer when you can actually be authentic. I'm sorry. I took us on a segue there, but I just <laughs> remembered that for a second. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to tell this story. So <laughs> I think that's important though to recognize it is contagious and yeah. it is a gift that you can give other people. We take that really seriously. If we're going to, sh to show up for a team, how can we embody that so that they can see authenticity and a very human way of being, even in a professional setting, because it gives others permission to do the same. And I think that is so important, especially for people leaders, especially for managers to feel empowered to be that example for their teams, because yeah. we're all going to falter. We're all going to have days where it's really hard to show up that way. Again, it's a practice, it's a choice, it's not a binary way of being. Mm -hmm. So as leaders, the biggest gift we can give is, hey, here's an example for you. Show up that way. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Leaders can do so much just by modeling behavior without having to change a policy or rework a workflow or anything like that. Just literally showing up differently and modeling a new way of being can have such an impact on your team and people in your life, frankly. Um, yeah. I know, Lex, we wanted to talk about some of the common misconnection yes. or misconnections, misconceptions around authenticity. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of these things is how we feel like we'll be perceived or how even maybe our manager, we feel like our manager might react to us if we show up, quote unquote, authentically. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I have a lot to say about that. I think <laughs> it first starts with understanding what authenticity is not. Mm -hmm. And it does not mean you roll out of bed and you're half asleep and you show up to a call. It does not mean you give feedback to somebody in a way that it lands as rude, shrouded in, well, I'm just being authentic. I'm telling you what I think. There still needs to be that effort for human connection and relation. It's about choosing who you want to be and embracing that and being really powerful in that. 
And that's hard. And I think that word authenticity has been dragged in the mud a little bit and misused Mm -hmm. almost as, I don't know if the weapon is the right word, but as a defense mechanism for people almost. Or an excuse almost. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you've got an entire team and you're operating in a collective and you're relating to authenticity as a defense mechanism, that creates barriers in your relationships when it's, a choice to operate from a place of power though it is it's as you said it's that invitation yeah i see people really struggle with that i think that's really good distinction and you know we've been doing a lot of research around what authenticity is and what authenticity isn't and as a result we've come up with our own kind of definition based on a lot of research and some of the aspects of it are autonomy like having the choice right but also responsibility So an understanding of you being accountable for your behavior, how it impacts others, how you show up in the moment, and and also a level of awareness. So it's self-awareness, but it's also contextual or cultural awareness too. So one of the things that I find is like a common misconception is what's authentic for you is authentic for you in every situation. And that's not the case. That doesn't mean that you won't still adjust your behavior when you show up differently in a meeting, then will then when you go out to dinner with your friends, you still have a context that you're showing up within. That doesn't mean that you're a different person at work than you are with friends though. And I think a lot of times we make the separation so much, like so defined, like such a wall there that we actually think that we are compartmentalizing ourselves into these different pieces when actually it's just a fluid ability to adjust based on what's required of you in that moment while still, again, not making those inner compromises as much as possible. Yeah. Where you're talking about the social context, what I think is really interesting too, is we used to go to the office and go home and maybe we went to the gym where we behaved a certain way and maybe Mm -hmm. we went to a party where we behaved a certain way. I'm in my living room. I'm in my living room and my TV's over there. I don't have that hard line anymore in regards to environmental contexts. Mm -hmm. So it's also this really interesting period of redefining that as well. And so that ability to evolve and to really think about who is the human being before me right now and how can I best show up for them as myself? It's a very different mental space to operate from. And again, we'll keep going back to this. It requires choice, a deliberate choice in the moment to be that way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I could just talk for days about the difference between a default reaction and a conscious choice to respond in the moment. And there is a world of difference in those things. And it takes a lot of practice to be able to get to the point where you can actually pause yourself and have the awareness in the moment, that presence, that's another aspect of authenticity, like being able to be here in the now moment so that you both actually have an embodied presence when you're interacting with someone, which is hugely impactful, but also that you can actually have the ability to pause the game. Because I don't know if you've, you've, Everyone probably has an example of when they become really good at something in their life and they know that they have a much clearer idea of what good looks like, which means that they almost can like slow down time. So I'll use like a volleyball example for just, I'm going to throw this out there because it's just what popped into my head. (laughs) You know, I am terrible at spiking for... (laughs) For example, I get up there and I would just wing it. I mean, I don't think I even look at my hand hitting the ball. So for me, it happens in a millisecond. I have no control over it whatsoever, right? And so I I don't even have the ability to make a change in how I do it because I just, I can't even see that it lasts for more than a split second. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to change in that time. But then you look at someone who has practiced volleyball and maybe plays it even at a professional level. And it seems like those people operate in slow motion because they honestly do. It's like they expand time and they have an ability to actually see exactly where the ball is and what the spin is and exactly how to move their hand and how high to jump and that someone is going to come block them across the net and they can adjust while they're in midair. And I'm over here thinking like, how are you doing this? And it's because they have so much practice at it. They see it differently. They yeah. see the situation differently. And as a result, they can see themselves and they can choose behavior. They can choose a response differently in the moment. 
that's kind of what I'm pointing at with this authenticity and being able to be responsible in a social context, being able to be in the present moment and being able to be um, autonomous in our choice to respond over react because the reaction is based on some bad behavior patterns or maybe good behavior patterns that we created as, as a result of our uh, development, not necessarily again, like serving you. And so being able to practice this more and more so that you can actually see what is happening in the moment, perceive what is happening in the moment and like pause and expand time. You almost become the observer of yourself and the observer of yourself and the interaction with other people. And then you have so much more choice. It's, it's wild. It's something that I, I've kind of, for the most part, I will say there are still times where I'm definitely more reactive than I'd like, but for the most part, I can observe myself in meetings. I can observe myself right now. I'm running on talking for a really long time and I need to pause. <laughs> Why am I having that reaction? Like all of this is happening at the same time. <laughs> but I, I just, I just want to make that point that yeah. the practice is so important. And the awareness in that practice is so important because it gives us so much opportunity for choice later. And honestly, that is what makes us not end the day really tired. It's almost like when we have no choice or when we have the view that the only choice is to go against something that is meaningful for us, that we tend to get exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. And and the work is how can we operate in a way that has us pausing, has us observing, has us choosing, and in doing that, actually yeah. generating energy from ourselves in how we show up. Yeah. I know we're at 22 minutes. We I are. told you we were going to last beyond 15. But I have to say one more thing, which is that mm -hmm. another common misconception that I just, I, I know we talked about this before we started, but I think this is a really important one. Oftentimes we see authenticity as almost a rebellion. Like something that you're doing that maybe you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be showing up this way. Uh oh, what will people think? Or even I think a lot of times managers see if I give my team permission to be authentic, that means they're going to do all of these things I don't want them to do. It's almost like you see it as a potential for rebellion. And I really want to call out the fact here that in order for something to be a rebellion, to be against something else or in reaction to something, there has to be some standard that we're comparing it to. And authenticity is really about creating a genuine kind of individual version of excellence here, not about creating a copy or replica of a standard someone else created. So anytime that we feel like we personally are in rebellion at like, is it dangerous to do this? Or even a manager's thinking they're not going to do the things I want them to be doing or show up the way I want them to when I give them permission to be authentic. This is a really good time to just evaluate where that is coming from <laughs> and think about what is the standard I'm holding people against or what is the standard I'm holding myself against? How did I find that standard? Who set that standard? is this actually true or resonant for me? Is this in harmony with my internal values? I feel like that's so important as it relates to being authentic. So important. Yeah. Oh, Brie, <laughs> I don't want this to end. May I ask you one more question? Shoot. Okay. For our community who is watching this now or a little later, let's say there is somebody who is at the very beginning of their journey towards authenticity as a practice, this is going to be a really tough question for you, Brie. Okay. What one question would you suggest they contemplate to begin to do this work, to start with? One of thousands, but where is a great contemplative question to start? I want to say what is important to me in my life so that you can start to contemplate values. And I want you to dig a little bit deeper because when you first ask yourself that question, all of the answers that flood into your head are probably going to be aligned with some example someone else has set for you, where they're going to be externally um, idealized things or an example that you got from someone else. 
And it actually takes quite a lot of contemplation to go beyond those things and to challenge why those things come into your head as things that are important for you. So I would say it's a pair of what's important to me, write out the list, no matter if it's things that pop up and you know that they're external or maybe some that aren't, and then go through and ask yourself why for each of those things. And just give that a little bit of a thought. Mm. What's important to me and why it's such a good place to start. Yeah. Bree, this has been so fun as it always is. Everybody, I'm not sure if you can tell, but Bree and I will talk about this for hours. So we will end ourselves here. But please know the invitation is extended to you. If you want to have a conversation with me or with Bree around what it means to be authentic as a practice, please connect with us. We would love to have that conversation with you. Yeah. In the meantime, we hope you have a beautiful rest of your week. We will see you soon. Oh, one thing I want to say. Ah, Call to action. Call to action. Lex is actually going to be hosting a Sell Like You series where she brings oh, right. sellers to talk about how they've practiced and struggled maybe with practicing authenticity at work and in their lives, which I'm so excited about. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's coming soon. So stay tuned for that. That'll be really great. Please, please do. Cannot wait for it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lex. Bye.